Good evening or good morning to where you are. Welcome to the Hong Kong Academy for Performing Arts School of Dance, Optimizing Dancer Potential Webinar Series. I'm Heidi Yu, I'm lecturer in dance science, and tonight we have Dr. Liliana Ararujo with us. Hello, Liliana. How are you? Hello. <laughs> I'm very well, thank you. Uh, good evening or good morning to everyone uh, that uh, joined us this, uh, today, and it has been a pleasure to join you uh, today for this for this seminar. Thank you very much. It's lovely to see a lot of uh, familiar names um, mm -hmm. in, in our participant list from the West and also from from uh, from Asia. So before we move on to what you uh, are going to present your res research, maybe we can start with you telling us, um, telling the audience a bit who you are and what do you do in Laban? Okay. Okay. Well, uh, I'm Liliana Araujo. I'm the program leader of the MSc and MFA in Dance Science, uh, Trinity Laban. Um, for those who don't know, Trinity Laban Conservatory of Music and Dance is uh, a specialist school in music and dance in the UK, in London, uh, and with a very strong dance science history and department. And I have the honor of leading the MSc and MFA. I also teach across the faculties of music and dance, um, I teach mostly uh, areas related to research methods and psychology. My background is in psychology. In psychology, I am a, a chartered uh, trained psychologist, um, and I've been kind of doing developing my career around performance psychology and psychology applied to the performing arts. My area of interest is mainly around health and well-being, psychological well-being. And in a way, this is part of the, the, the content that I bring today uh, to you to share with you. Okay. Before, before we go dive into the presentation, mm -hmm. you mentioned um, psychology, well-being, performance psychology across dance and music. Can you just give us a bit of background information um, to the audience? What is psychology in dance or performance psychology? Mm -hmm. Very good question to start with. Okay, so um, well, we can we can take like the easiest way. So in a way, uh, performance psychology or psychology applied to the performing arts is the easiest way to explain is like sports psychology, where we understand the psychological mechanisms and processes that explain and help us understand uh, performance. And commonly, we, we look at sports psychology as kind of the, the, guide, the, the guidance for what we do in the performing arts. So in a way, performance psychology is looking at the psychological processes and, and mechanisms that apply, that help us understand performance as an output, but also what happens to the performer. And here we can be talking about musicians or dancers or other performing artists or even other kinds of performers if we want to expand that to businessmen or athletes or other areas. But in this particular case, uh, and in my own work and research, I'm very um, interested in looking at, for example, what explains excellence in performance or what explains or can support performance health and well-being or how can we um, better understand and support more sustainable, more healthier careers in the performing arts? I, I hope like that you, helped. <laughs> yeah, I like how you put it, um, support to sustain the career. So we mm -hmm. think of um, dancing as very physical or uh, very performing uh, an, an industry, but actually there's a lot going on Mm -hmm. driven by the mind, driven by the mental health that makes us a better dancer or a better teacher. Exactly. Great. So um, you will share a recent research with us that you conducted both across music and dance faculty and students in Trinity Laban. Then we'll open the floor for uh, all your questions and also any discussions or comments. So please leave your questions and comments in the chat box there anytime. So we will answer them after your presentation. So over to you now. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so let me just share my screen. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about this research. So 
just uh, arrange my screen. Okay, so I'm going to present today to you or to share with you some findings from a study that we conducted last year when we all kind of uh, were affected by the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, we all, almost like the entire world, at different places, but we all moved uh, from a very physical, present, embodied experience of learning and teaching in the performing arts to an online learning and teaching experience. And I'm sure that all of you in this room today, in this virtual room today, have been through that e experience and the impact of that experience um, uh, on your own kind of life, uh, both as a person, uh, but also in your professional or artistic life. So at that point, we decided to conduct a survey to start to understand what was the impact of the pandemic or what were the experience, the motivational and emotional experience of uh, both students and teachers. Um, um, in their learning and teaching experience. So we were really looking at psychological functioning and well-being, and in particular, we look at motivation, stress, and burnout among performing artists during the pandemic. So let me this. Okay, so to start with, I'd like to share some, some concepts with you for those who may not be so familiarized uh, with these concepts. So we looked at motivation, and within the concept of motivation, we looked at uh, a, a very uh, popular uh, theory called the self-determination theory. Uh, and this is in a way a meta theory that has many ways of explaining motivation and motivation as a, a, a factor that explains our psychological well-being, but also our uh, functioning and productivity and commitment to what we do. And within this theory, there's two main ideas to, to retain here. One is this idea of the basic psychological needs. Uh, and according to this theory, we need as human beings to find autonomy, competence and related, relatedness in our lives. And as it says here, um, foster the most volitional and high quality forms of motivation and engagement for activities, including enhanced performance, persistence, and creativity. So according to this theory, if we meet these basic psychological needs of feeling autonomous, feeling competent, and relate to others, these will impact positively our performance, our well-being, and our creativity. The other idea to retain here is this idea of a continuum of motivation and internalization of external motives. So usually when we talk about motivation, we talk about intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. And we tend to say that intrinsic motivation is better and extrinsic motivation can be less positive. Um, but actually within this theory, they conceptualize this continuum where we can have very important external motivation or external motives, but the more we internalize those, the more they can actually become part of our intrinsic autonomous motivation. So as it says here, the more individuals experience support and satisfaction for autonomy, competence and relatedness within a given domain or activity, the more likely they are to internalize and take responsibility and ownership for actions. And you'll see how these then relate to the findings of this research project. The other important concept to include here was the concept of stress. And here we are basically talking about that relationship between the person and the environment that is appraised by the person as taxing or exceeding his or her resources and endangering his or her well-being. So basically, we are talking about stress when there's a, a change to our sense of balance between the demands of a particular task or what we are facing in a particular environment and our capacity to manage to deal with the, the demands of that uh, situation. Now, we are also looking at burnout and burnout as a psychological syndrome of emotional or and or physical exhaustion, reduced sense of accomplishment and job devaluation due to chronic stress or dissatisfaction. So basically, we are talking about burnout as an extreme level of continuous stress that can impair or can impact 
uh, our engagement with a certain activity, our sense of satisfaction and accomplishment. So you can see here how these concepts of autonomy, relatedness, sense, feeling competent uh, are important for our uh, motivation and well-being, and how they probably probably have been uh, uh, altered significantly due to the changes that result from the COVID pandemic. So based on these ideas that there was a lot of change in the way we engage with learning and teaching in the performing arts as a result of the uh, pandemic, we decided to do a cross-faculty collaborative project that involved uh, students and staff from the dance faculty, but also from the music faculty. And this was basically because we had a series of students interested in understanding more about the motivation, what happened to motivation and to engagement in learning of music and dance through the a complete change in our lives and the complete change the way in the way we study and work in the performing arts. So our general objective was to identify the psychological impact of online learning on music and dance students' learning motivation and emotional experience. This project was approved by our um, 2011 Research Ethic Committee, and we created, it was a complex study, and here I'm just selecting some, uh, some, some findings to share with you. We had a quantitative and a qualitative uh, element to it. We did interviews as well. And uh, for the quantitative survey, um, we had an extensive list of um, uh, standardized measures that we used. For this presentation, I'm going to focus mostly on those related to motivation, stress, and burnout. Okay. So this give you, gives you an idea of the participants we had. So we had 75 teachers. And here, because we didn't find many, many difference between music and dance teachers, we include them together here in this uh, pool of teachers. And then we had uh, roughly the same numbers for dance students and music students, mostly uh, women participating in this study. And one interesting point was here to look at those who return to their home country. And as we can see students, a great percentage of students, mostly dance students, returned to their home country for the lockdown period last year. Um, this study was focusing on students and teachers in higher education. So you can see here distribution of the uh, participant sample across conservatoires, university, and program of study. So quite a, a representat representative uh, sample of higher education learning and teaching in music and dance. Okay, so let's discuss some of the results. And these results are in a way, mostly we, we have been thinking about them as a reflective point for how do we engage with learning and teaching in the performing arts. So let's start by talking about motivation. Um, as you can see on the screen, uh, we one of the things that we looked at was self-efficacy to maintain practice under adversity. And uh, because we wanted to see what kind of facilitates uh, the sense of feeling competent to co continue to practice under an adversity and lockdown and the pandemic was a major adversity. So what we can see here on the screen is that of course, students feel more able to sustain practice when they have favorable situations and we all know that. But what we were interested in was to look at what happens in terms of adverse situations. And what we see here is that music students struggle mostly when they find adverse internal situations. And this means that when music students feel that they are going through any kind of emotional um, issues or distress, those kind of internal situations or concerns or worries, that is what impact them or uh, affect them, their capacity to feel that they can sustain practice under adversity. In terms of the dance students, um, they felt that what they struggle more was with environmental situations. And this makes sense. Uh, for, for dance, you kind of need more space 
um, and and the lockdown impacted greatly on that aspect of uh, environmental adversity in a way. So this kind of shows us what were the main uh, areas of adversity that students struggle with. Uh, and it also made us reflect on how are we preparing our students to be able to sustain their practice under adversity. So it was a really interesting reflective point on how can we create, for example, for music students, a greater sense of competence and self-efficacy and autonomy to persist uh, uh, their practice even when they are not feeling so well. So how do we uh, self-regulate to sustain practice under adversity? Now, we also looked at, uh, we asked students about what motivate them. And uh, going back to the self-determination theory and that idea of a continuum between extrinsic and intrinsic motivation, you can see here on the screen some examples of the items on the uh, questionnaires that we used. So within this theory, we look at intrinsic motivation, which is in a way the most pure form of motivation. So it's about enjoyment and pleasure um, and be driven by that sense of pleasure and enjoyment. And then integrated, identified in interjective motivation is more about aligning our enjoyment and values and goals with maybe some external um, motives. So for example, with identifies, um, it is one of the best ways I have chosen to develop other aspects of myself. Uh, and then we have external motivation, which is basically because other people uh, I care about would be upset if, with me if I didn't. So it's more that concerned with external val validation and a sense of worth. And then uh, unmotivated is that um, mostly the main driver is so that others praise me for what I do. So let's see what students responded to these. So the good news here is that most students have high levels of the kind, the continuum of the motivation that are close to intrinsic motivation. And we know that the more we feel that we do things because we enjoy, because it reflects who we, we are, the more autonomous we feel about what we do, more independent and competent we feel about what we do. The more we rely on extrinsic or internalized external factors, the less autonomous we will feel. Now here, as I said, the good news is that actually music and dance students have high levels of intrinsic, integrated and identified motivation, but they also have quite high levels of interjected motivation. And as you see here in the example, it's something like I would feel bad if I did not take time to do it, uh, uh, is an example of what explains this interjected motivation. And in our research, we actually had uh, from the qualitative research, a series of students, mostly music student, students, uh, referring to how difficult it was to keep motivated without the external deadlines, without, for example, for example, have a, a performance to aim for or a final year uh, rehearsal and performance to aim to. So these, in a way, made us reflect that actually um, it's something for us to think about. If students become too dependent on external deadlines and motivations, this can actually impact their motivation and sense of autonomy and competence, which may explain the levels of self-efficacy as well in terms of environmental and internal uh, um, factors and adversity. So this is something that made us reflect as well. How are we preparing our students to actually move towards these types of motivation, uh, knowing that interjected motivation, there is some alignment with external factors, but is more about creating that sense of guilt and you know feeling bad if if they don't do it or feel that uh, their sense of worth and competence and talent or excellence depends on uh, other other factors or depends on an external factor. So it was interesting to look at this as well. Okay, 
Now, if you remember, we talked about this idea of basic psychological needs, and we looked at the basic psychological needs of our students and also our teachers. So here, uh, if you remember, we have autonomy, competence, and this sense of relatedness and or belonging. And I don't know if you had the same experience, but we were very concerned that the lockdown impacted greatly a sense of community and relatedness and, and being part of. And in a way, that affected that sense of being part of. But actually, in our results, the highest results was on relatedness. So they actually felt cared for. They actually felt that the teachers, the colleagues, everyone was concerned with, with them and with their progress, which was really good to see that. Now, where they felt maybe less, um, that their basic psychological needs were less met was in terms of their sense of competence. Um, and this relates to things like feeling that they are not achieving as they wish, or feeling that they don't have opportunities to show their, their sense of competence and their uh, skill level, which relates to the previous um, uh, result as well. So maybe we were so worried trying to find ways to make sure that the students were looked after and you know that they were part of a community, that the fact that we remove, removed many aspects of their learning and teaching like presentations or performance, may actually have impacted their sense of feeling that they were achieving and that they were feeling competent. So it was also something interesting for us to reflect on. Now, in terms of the teachers, we also looked at their basic psychological needs. You can see on the screen some examples of um, uh, autonomy, relatedness and competence. And in these, within this scale, we look at satisfaction and frustration. So, to which extent I feel that my sense of competence it has been satisfied or frustrated. Uh, and what we see here is that actually uh, teachers feel highly competent and they feel that they have been doing their jobs properly, that they can successfully complete difficult tasks. Um, and the lowest level was in terms of autonomy. And uh, we can see here that there is, you know, ideally we want something like this, a higher level of satisfaction and a lower level of frustration. And this is where uh, teachers also felt their, their sense of autonomy, of having choice uh, in, in terms of doing the things they feel they need to prioritize or actually feel pressure to do too many things on their jobs was what was most, most affected by the lockdown and the pandemic. Okay, so these lead us then to talk about stress and burnout. And I guess we can already sense how these results feed into these, uh, these results too. Okay, one of the questions we asked was to teachers was how satisfied are you with impact of the shift to online teaching due to COVID-19 con contingency measures? on different aspects of their work and uh, of their work. And um, what we see here was that their levels of satisfaction were mostly concerning in terms of work-life balance. So teachers felt that they were actually very dissatisfied with their work-life balance, but also with their workload and well-being as well. So we can see how this is going in terms of stress and burnout. They felt that their engagement was quite high, their relationship with students, they were very satisfied with that, uh, with colleagues as well, with senior management. So in terms of relations with others uh, was, was good, but in terms of work-life balance, well-being and workload, that was quite challenging for teachers. Okay, so then we looked at stress and burnout. And for these results, we, we didn't use the stress and burnout uh, skills for music students, uh, only uh, dance students and teachers, music and dance teachers. Here, what we can see is that in terms of stress, uh, dance students had very high levels of stress um, and teachers had moderate levels of stress, perceived stress when we, 
of course, we are looking at a time, uh, a point in time when we did the surveys. And we know that at, some, at this point, some people were uh, working on their final assessments, marking for dance students, their final performance, but others, participants have already finished their, their work at that time as well, so around June and July. But here, again, some indicators of high levels of stress. In terms of burnout, if we look at the mid scale, so the highest level is five, if we look at 2.5 as the mid of the scale, what we can see is actually some kind of worrying uh, uh, results showing some levels of burnout. So we see here, uh, for teachers in terms of exhaustion, and this was mostly emotional exhaustion, this was the highest level um, of burnout, the element of burnout, and then students around reduced accomplishment, which again aligns with that idea that they weren't feeling that their sense of competence and accomplishment was being met during the lockdown. But this means that at that time, and it would be interesting to see how things evolved after an year, that there were quite borderline levels of post-stress and burnout. The other thing that we uh, asked uh, teachers about was to, let me just, I'm trying to remove this bar. Um, I'm sorry for this, okay. Um, so in terms of teachers, we also ask them to what extent the following conditions were currently causing them stress or reason for concern. And you, as you can see there at the top of the list is all related to expectations, excessive demands. So all aspects related to managing workloads and managing expectations. We also did a, a regression analysis, statistic analysis, to look at what predicted teachers' burnout levels. And we saw two main factors. One was the level of stress. So the higher the level of stress, the higher the, higher the, the, the level of potentially uh, burnout symptoms. And the other predictor was coping strategies, especially seeking emotional support and active coping. So those who use less emotional support and engaged less in terms of trying to find a way to manage their workloads and other things, the more likely they were to have symptoms of burnout. So what have we learned from this, uh, this research? This, is, this was in a way a, a pilot research looking at motivational impact of the pandemic on students and teachers. And what are the practical implications of these lessons? In terms of the students, what we what these findings uh, uh, made us reflect on was on this need to foster autonomy and the sense of accomplishment competent, and competence among students, especially when we are facing adversity, and especially in terms of equipping uh, students with the skills, with the competence, with the level of confidence that they can still achieve, they can still accomplish and show their skills and their talent. Uh, under adversity. And this can be done in many different ways. So it can be in terms of looking at ways to provide meaningful choice, where we can encourage students to nurture their motivation, what is that interest them, what is that they want to focus on, really drive their motivation to the tasks that they engage with. Providing rational, so explaining, offering clarity, consistency of information that can give students a, a greater sense of autonomy, but also providing opportunities for personalization. So, and these relate mostly with flexibility to customize learning and assessment. Is there any way we can offer more choice or offer the opportunity for them to focus on something that they enjoy, that they like? So these will uh, foster the sense of autonomy and accomplishment. In terms of the teachers, uh, the findings suggest that we need to foster, to encourage individual and institutional psychological literacy. So what does this mean? This means that maybe both teachers, but also institutions need to understand a bit more about the psychological impact of our jobs and how to better support all of us, all the teachers, all the community uh, to be more, um, 
to be better equipped to deal also deal with adversity. Uh, and these some examples of ways to doing this is, for example, uh, creating opportunities for teachers to seek emotional support, to reduce self-blame and engage in active coping strategies because we know these can reduce stress and burnout. So creating opportunities for that to be shared, to be uh, for teachers to be supported in that. The other aspect that is important is to look at expectations, uh, which are different. And we all know that in terms of face-to-face -face learning or online learning or blended learning. So careful consideration of workload will be needed moving forward. We all needed that during this time because the expectations and the engagement and the management of time is different. And in terms of institutions, more specifically, we can look at ways of reducing unnecessary structures, maybe streamline processes, looking at what is really essential and finding the simplest way to communicate that, but also promote reflection. Maybe, you know, it would be great if we could all stop for a day and think about, okay, what worked well, what didn't work well, what can we uh, take from, uh, learn from this experience. Increase opportunities for interdepartmental activities, reduce barriers to the individual initiative and promote a culture of innovation. So it's really about sharing and creating opportunities for these discussions to happen openly, uh, because that will foster this sense of autonomy, of competence, of uh, clearing kind of the sense of burnout and emotional distress in a way. Okay, so we know that there has been some limitations of this study. Uh, one is the, the sample is actually a small sample to make these general generalizations. We know that um, maybe the measures we used, uh, we didn't use all the measures to all the, the, the participants, so students, dancers and teachers. So we may maybe streamline that in the future. Uh, we are also aware that in terms of social and background information and lockdown measures and their implications, there's differences. We now know a year later that each country went into lockdown measures differently and implementing different lockdown measures, which also have impact or reflect social, cultural and background information as well. So we are working in new projects and we have a new project also uh, being launched at the Hong Kong uh, Academy of Performing Arts. But it, this was in a way a first reflective point from this research to really make us think about what is the impact of adversity in learning and teaching in the performing arts. And this is me. Thank you very much. You have here my references. And over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Lilian. There's a lot of information. I know. I'm so sorry. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I try uh, to streamline we'll... to make it small, you know, just sele a selection of the study. There's so much more out there. Okay. Mm. Um, maybe we start with answering some questions here we had in the chat box and then mm -hmm. I have a few questions for you um, mainly is around the topics that you brought up in the presentation so we might go into a bit deeper some of sure uh, from Sunny Chen and um, he asked thanks for your presentation and sharing just wondering if you have also done any analysis on gender differences in that uh, the stress, motivation, or burnout? Yeah, we did some preliminary analysis. We need to go more in depth into the analysis, actually. Um, and we didn't find major um, significant differences um, between women and men. But it's something that we'll, we'll need to look in more depth, actually. We need to look at predictors. Uh, no, we, there was one different, significant difference, actually, um, for teachers in terms of stress and burnout, being a, wo uh, a woman was actually a predictor of burnout. So actually women tend to, will have more tendency or are more likely to, uh, to have symptoms of burnout. But we only saw that when we did the, the, the regression analysis, not the, the, the difference between groups analysis. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Liliana. You're welcome. 
if we go back to the beginning of the presentation, you introduced the idea of there's a spectrum of motivation mm -hmm. from internalized all the way to a motivation, like not motivated or sorry, external. Mm -hmm. and, and we know from research of theories that this intrinsic motivation is more likely to keep us motivated. And I think in real life stories is that you see that one person in the studio and she's like, full of energy every day. She mm -hmm. showed her love to, to the work. And how do we, what, what are your points on helping our musicians or dancers to discover or to mm -hmm. re, regain the loss of the motivation? Because sometimes, as you said, when they're burnout, just not interested at all in, yeah. in dancing or in performing any instruments. So what can they do or what can a teacher does to help them with that? Yeah, it's very simple actually. Uh, it's about finding, refining enjoyment, and and you know how to foster these, re fostering this idea that why do you do these? Why why are why are you dancing? Why are you studying or, or uh, studying music or dance? And it's really about creating opportunities. Um, for enjoyment, rediscovering enjoyment, and this is something that we see across the across the the lifespan. Actually, you know, when when and may, maybe some of you have that experience that at some point we forget why do we do what we do, what is that we enjoy about what we do. So that sense of intrinsic motivation really comes from that place of pleasure and enjoyment, and sometimes it's just trying to remember that again and try to um engage with activities that foster that sense okay what gives you pleasure what is that you are enjoying how can you enjoy this more how does this align with what you aim in your profession or the values that you have uh, and it may look it's very simple the answer but i know that in real life is quite difficult but sometimes it's just about reminding ourselves of why do we do what we do what what took us there in the first place? Uh, does it work mm -hmm. the same way that you, if, if we try to transform some uh, external motivation in, to become something that is actually internal, does it work the same way? So you keep asking the question, uh, why do I feel good when my mom praised me when I did a dance? Mm. Does it work the same way as well? Like you said, it's better to transform, internalize those external yeah. feelings. Yeah, you know, we can't really, uh, as human beings, it, it's so much more complicated than looking at theory, isn't it? You know, and we know that external motivations, having the praise from other people or having a good grade, that's important and that's good. That can be good. The, the, the point is to which extent our sense of self-worth is full dependent on that. And, you know, one thing is um, to think I'm, I'm really enjoying these, you know, and if I have a good grade, great. If my parents praise me for these, I will feel even better. But first of all, I'm really enjoying the process. I'm really, you know, this is really what I want to do or I can find a way of this will be really important for my career. The other thing is to have the focus on I need these so that my parents can praise me. I need to do these so that... I have a good grade because what matters is the grade. And it's almost like moving as away from, uh, you know, it's almost like there's a grade there and that's our, our engagement and our motivation. I know it's easier to describe in the literature, in the theory than in practice, but sometimes it's really about us reflecting, how is this aligning with my values? And sometimes having to say, oh, it, this would be a great opportunity, but actually I don't identify myself with that. This is not going to give me anything extra for my career. Do I really need to do that? And sometimes we don't even question that. Mm -hmm. So it requires a lot of self-reflection as well, I think. <laughs> I think that's definitely very important. We always define uh, in, in, in performing arts, you, you look at a dancer, a performer, has he won any competition? Has he gotten any results from something and that kinds of um that is driving the focus away from how well the person 
is actually dancing or how much effort he's putting in. Exactly. Um, so from Brenton, we have a question mm -hmm. and he asked, do we think there are any, there might be any different for different cultures? Mm -hmm. So the self-determination theory, it's majority of it was done in the West. So what mm -hmm. would it be able to reflect the same value in other culture, like Asian culture, for example? Yeah. That's a very good question. And there's another one that I will tie to this one about personality. Uh, it is really interesting that actually the self-determination theory has been expanding to look at differences between cultures. And what this theory says is that we all have these basic psychological needs. Now, we all have different personality characteristics. We all have different cultural values. So yes, definitely there will be difference between us in terms of our personality characteristics, our um, cultural values. What the self-determination theory suggests is that that sense of competence, autonomy and relatedness will be also about aligning that with what is important to us within a certain culture or within what is that we value as a person with our personality characteristics. And I'll give you an example. You may be working in, a, in, a, in an environment that uh, is very structured and, and give you very little sense of autonomy. You just have to do what you are told. But for some people, that is actually good. Some mm -hmm. people actually thrive in their environment because actually for them, being feeling autonomous in, a, in, the, in the workplace is not, is not what is important. What is important is actually they have an opportunity to feel competent and within that environment, they are fine with that or they engage with other colleagues. But for someone else who maybe values more a sense of independence and autonomy, that work environment will not work for them. And maybe they will either choose to leave or accept that and find the sense of autonomy elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So this means that we don't just satisfy our basic psychological needs in one environment. We can satisfy them in different ways in our personal life, in our life with our friends, in our hobbies. We may feel more competent in our through our hobbies. So yes, certainly there will be differences between uh, what are our values, what are our cultural values, what are our personality characteristics? But what these theories say is we all, and this is across all theories of motivation throughout life, we all feel as human beings that we need to seek more. We are interested, we are curious, we want to challenge ourselves, and, but we also need to feel part of a community and cared for. So this is how this translates into these three basic psychological needs. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying this. And um, I guess my question now will be um, through your research and teaching experience. So maybe not just this one research. Mm -hmm. Do you see any changes in uh, the dance or music community where, where this um, performance psychology concepts are introduced and then they try to implement better practice in terms of enhancing the student's psychological well-being? Yes, I do see some changes. Maybe in the past five years, there's so much more awareness mm -hmm. of well-being, of ways to do things to feel better, to feel stronger, there is that awareness. So I think that's the starting point that people are more curious and are more open to start these kind of discussions or, or to look for you know, apps uh, or maybe do things to you know, support them in their uh, physical strength or try to find a way to sleep better. So I think overall, also because how the world has been kind of advocating for well-being and for wellness so it's trendy now to find to find balance and it, it's so stressful isn't it to so suddenly we have to sleep well and eat well and do exercise and socialize and do our job full of motivation and that kind of brings another level of 
pressure, the pressure to be well and balanced. But I think there is definitely more awareness and more interest and curiosity. Uh, I think the next step is actually to be brave enough as institutions, as teachers, to start uh, bringing what the psychology um, the science in a way uh, explains and integrate it more within our programs and within our environments as well. So how can we promote more supportive environments? How can we, and keeping the high quality. So in a way I often say, and I know Anastasia is here, um, I often say that, for example, psychological health and well-being shouldn't be something that we only look at when there's an issue, when there's a problem. Uh, there's a depression following injury or there's anxiety uh, towards performance. But actually, we should look at it as an ingredient for mm -hmm. high level performance. So the more we feel well and better and functioning and resilient, the more that will uh, lead people to perform better, to be more productive, to be more motivated. So I, I often say that we have to place psychological well-being as a core skill for performance. We often look at the physical aspect, but we are human beings. Yeah. Uh, even we, if we are dancers or, or musicians, first of all, we are human beings and complete human beings. So that psychological well-being and resilience it's something that maybe we need to start thinking about as a skill when you say it's one of the ingredients that makes me think of so the next time when people ask us uh, what makes a dance what makes a good dancer we we'll say okay she needs to have um, adequate turnout flexibility mm -hmm. and strength and the good psychological skills <laughs> so that should go uh, into the physical ability as well mm -hmm. yeah Another question from Sunny Chen. Uh, apart from motivation or stress coping, any ideas can be shared for peak performance or any mm -hmm. psychological input? Yeah, well, there has been a lot of research around, again, these ingredients for excellence and for peak performance. And we know that in terms of psychological characteristics and skills, um, we are looking at, for example, effective use of imagery, effective practice, practice that is not just, you know, rehearsing for hours, but actually mindful, planned, structured practice. Um, and all of that, that can feel like it's very physical and practical, but actually it requires that you are, that you set goals, that you set objective goals and realistic goals, that you... Um, for example, is imagery as a resource as well, that you are flexible enough to adjust adjust to the, the to what you observe in your practice as well. So that kind of psychological characteristics that we often only look as, okay, how can we prevent or manage stress or burnout are actually the ones that lead us to develop this psychological resilience. The more that we um kind of strengthen our mind our psyche uh the more we'll feel uh, competent or or able to manage adversity and this adversity can be stress and, and persistent stress um so brenton mentioned um, mindfulness uh for example um there's we know from research that this is more and more uh, uh, known as an effective kind of skill and strategy to have a mindful approach uh, to, to practice and to performance, because these allow us to reflect on the present and to kind of clear our thinking process from, you know, things that have been in the past or worries, constant worries, but actually focus on the present. What is that I can work with at the present moment? And that allow us to find solutions, to not be stuck to the present or, or anticipate too much the future, but actually see what is that I can do now in the present? What is my goal now? What is my action plan? And all, all of these allow us to 
develop our resilience. This is all about becoming more resilient. It doesn't mean that we'll not suffer from stress or it doesn't mean that we'll not face adversity, but we will be better equipped to deal with it when it comes. I think that's um, allowing the training or any practice become more effective. So it's, it's a high quality training time and also the results from it are at a higher quality, which goes hands in, hand in hand where you won't be overtraining because your quality was high enough so you don't need to stay mm -hmm. in the studio for 10 yeah. hours. So mind and the physical body, both are all entwined. entwined. Yeah. Very yeah. well. And if we think about, for example, goal setting, how we set our goals for our practice. And sometimes that's as simple as that. We overtrain because we don't have clear goals. We feel that we just need to train to reach a final goal. But what is that we are actually achieving during those four hours? What, what is that we want to achieve? Is this realistic? Can we break it down? Is it productive or efficient? And sometimes it's actually better to have smaller practice uh, sessions, both for musicians and dancers, with breaks that allow our body to rest and recover. We all know that from the physical aspect of practice, but also to allow us, our mind, to process the information. We are cognitive people. Mm -hmm. And we, we know, all know how we have been struggle, struggling during lockdown to focus concentration, to be, you know, to memorize things because we don't have those breaks. We are constantly on. And breaks, recover, sleep, all those habits allow us, our mind, to function better as well. Mm -hmm. So it's something that is actually very, very linked to the way we our, organize dance and music training, actually effective dance, uh, music and dance training. So um, you have said goal setting, some psychological skills training and also mindfulness. Is there any uh, other intervention that is in your head that you would like to share with us? Um, you know, sometimes it's really just about learning, developing some awareness. And I'll give you an example. A couple of years ago, at Trinity Lab, and we have a module called um, Physical Development and Awareness. Um, and within that module for the uh, undergraduate dance students, and we have a similar one. I actually teach music psychology for the undergraduate music students. And in both, actually in both modules, we started by actually doing a questionnaire where the students rated their own levels of stress, of well-being, of uh, coping strategies. And we use that as a starting point to discuss what is stress? What is the good and bad side of stress? How can we support? How can we sustain well-being? How do we manage? How do we cope? Which, which strategies do you often use? And within that, both modules, actually, we saw that self-blame was a very high coping strategy. Most people use self-blame as a way to manage. I'm stressed because I'm not good enough, because I haven't prepared well, and using self-blame a lot. And what we saw was after those that, that module, one of the things that the students comment most on was, I became more aware of how do I manage? What is, how, what, what is that I do to manage with anxiety, with stress, with deadlines? And I tried to do, uh, to look at ways to feel better prepared. So I start to sleep better. I, I know that it's not because I'm not good or because I'm not, I didn't prepare well. Um, I try to prepare better. I look at setting goals more realistically. So actually just those sessions developed that awareness among students that actually led them to take action, to think, what is that I can, I, I can do to feel less anxious, to actually feel better and better prepared? If I feel better prepared, I will feel less anxious. So how, how can I feel better prepared? Maybe not procrastinate so much, maybe look at my sleep because I need to recover, maybe eating well. So it was actually just that, just building that awareness was a starting point for, for students to start changing their, their lifestyles, their behavior. So 
would say we can look at lots of interventions, but actually if we start talking about these things within the curriculum, um, that could be a really, a real, a really effective way of, of starting changing behaviors and changing the conversation about this. I know we are reaching the, the time of the webinar. I don't know if there's any final questions. <laughs> um, I don't see any question popping up now, um, but uh, as you said, I'm very glad that dance science is integrated actually in our dance program here. And even if we're not doing interventions with our students, as you mentioned, just bring in the awareness. So maybe someday when they reflect on their practice and looking at the journey they have here at the school, um, it should be very interesting to, as a starting point, like you planted a mm -hmm. seed in their head. Um, maybe last one from Farah. Hello, Farah. <laughs> um, dance movement therapy is commonly used to treat physical, psychological, cognitive, and social issues. Would you say dance psychology and dance therapy are similar? Thank you for your question. They are similar, but they are different as well. So dance therapy is very much about using dance as a mean, as a, uh, as a, a vehicle to express and to manage uh, psychological uh, issues. So in a way, people that need to deal with psychological issues, um, in dance therapy, we, we use dance as the therapeutic mean. Instead of, you know, talking therapies, we have talking therapies like CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, where we talk about our issues and how can we change our, our processes, for example. Through dance therapy, we use dance as a way of express our feelings or our thoughts and process those. So in that way, it's different from what we usually call dance psychology, because dance psychology is more about uh, applying psychological theory and concepts to understand dance, dance practice, dance performance and the dancer, uh, not so much about therapy in, in that way. However, they both use theories and concepts from psychology. So there's different, different um, branches in psychology, let's call it like that. It just the focus is different. So therapy is one of the media that you would use. Yeah. There's a, like a condition. Right. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up now. And um, we're planning to do a parallel study here in APA with our mm -hmm. uh, students, both in music and dance. And it will be interesting to compare it with your results. And maybe as Brenton said, there might be a cultural differences. Yes. Some different things are driven. And so thank you very much for sharing with us tonight and engaging in this important topic for our community. We would love to have you again. <laughs> so, My pleasure. Um, Next week at the same time, Wednesday, June the 2nd, we have invited Professor Matt Wyan from the University of Wolverhampton to talk about strength and conditioning in dance training. Please register when we have the post um, updated and we'll see you again very soon. Thanks again, Liliana. Thank you, my pleasure. Take care everyone. And if you have any questions, feel free to be in touch as well. Um, yeah, and it's lots of food for thought for next for the for the for the future. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you and have a great evening or morning or day. <laughs> See you again. Bye. Bye bye. bye.